Thank you for this opportunity to speak, uh, to represent French Camp, and the uh, great privilege it is to bring you God's Word. I'm going to be preaching from Psalm chapter 1, and let me read this. I'm reading out of the New International Version. Psalm chapter 1. <clears throat> Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. May God add his blessing to his holy, infallible word to strengthen us that we might serve him better. I've been reading in Genesis this month, and God's promises to Abraham caught my attention. In Genesis chapter 12, there are many promises that are given, but one stood out to me, and that is the fact that Abraham was promised by God that he would be a blessing to all the families on the earth. That in Abraham, all the people groups, which is another way of translating the word, would be blessed by you. Here we sit, 4,000 years after Abraham. And in the millennia since Abraham walked on this earth, millions have heard the gospel and believe the gospel through a series of circumstances known and orchestrated by God I came to believe the gospel and I trust you believe it also several centuries ago God moved committed believers to come to America and they kept coming to America through boats and all types of ways and as a result of the promise to Abraham, the good news of Jesus Christ was taught to others, who taught it to others, until it reached us. Missions at work. One of the popular websites today is Ancestry.com. You can trace your physical lineage back to Europe or England or even southern England, so I'm told, or South America. That's fantastic. That's very interesting stuff. But I think that even more interesting is the possibility and the likelihood and the reality that we'll see in heaven, and maybe we know a little bit of it now, but that is tracing your spiritual lineage. I remember as a college freshman, I went to a Campus Crusade for Christ meeting. And uh, I was a church goer. God had used other people in my life, my parents and the churches that I attended. But that night, as a freshman, a young man in his 20s, a staff member at Campus Crusade for Christ, shared the four spiritual laws with me. And God's Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin. Verses I had heard hundreds of times before, and yet I was convicted that good guy Tom, and I was a good guy, the mamas in the neighborhood liked their kids to hang out with me because I kept them out of trouble. But I wasn't a believer. I was just a good guy. But that night, I saw myself the way God saw me, a sinner who fell far short of the standard of Christ. And I prayed forgiveness based on Jesus' work for me. And I became a believer. And heaven will be able to see and understand how God carried out this promise to Abraham. 
He sent that man to me that evening at that meeting. I just have a recollection of him in my head. I don't remember his name. But others brought the gospel to him, and you could go back and back, and somebody brought the gospel to those people, and there was a connection. Those blessed by missions work should bless others with missions work. Thank you for the missions work you do at French Camp Academy. I don't know how many kids have come to know Christ, but I know there for sure there are some. I personally know them. But through the decades, there are many at French Camp that have come to know Jesus through the work of people committed to missions like you have been. One of the things that I know is that God has used the written word in blessing the nations. He has used the written word promulgated by all types of means to bless millions and millions of people who have come to faith. The Psalms were written over a thousand year period by at least six different authors. Psalm 90, probably the first written, written by Moses somewhere about 1440 BC. And the last of the Psalms, attributed to Ezra, written about 440 BC. Ezra came to a situation after the Babylonian captivity and the people came back to Jerusalem and things were in disarray physically. Nehemiah and others rebuilt the temple and, and the wall, but Ezra the priest was concerned with the spiritual dilapidation of the people, and he began to use the word of God to revive. Psalm 1 focuses on the word of God, and it speaks about something that all of us want to have, and that is blessedness. What is it? What does it mean to be blessed? It's a word that's used a lot. And um, you know, I was looking at something by Sinclair Ferguson, a devotion that he has started this year, Things Unseen, which is a great devotion. And he brought out something, he titled the devotion, The Mouth of God. And he said that he was looking at a confession of faith written by John Knox and, and others back in the 1500s called the Scots Confession. And at the beginning, Knox wrote of this Scots Confession that they sent out to all the pastors and people who wanted it. If anything is misleading, let us know and we will answer you and seek to correct it using the mouth of God. I thought that was an interesting way to put things. But you probably remember that when Jesus was in the wilderness being tested by Satan, he responded, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So this word blessed that's used in Psalm 1, some translations actually translated happy. Happy is he. Now there are all types of books out there on how to be happy. And there are studies that I've heard about just recently on, you know, uh, how do you find happiness? Well, one of the things is God's Word talks to us about it. In James, we just read that if we're doers of the Word, and that usually involves not satisfying ourselves, but being a servant, if we're doers of the Word, we will be blessed. So the key is not to pursue happiness in and of itself for myself. The key is to be a doer of the Word for God's glory and other people's good, and the outcome involves my own growth and happiness and blessedness. How wonderful that is. So as we look at this passage, one of the things that we have to reorient our minds to is what is spoken of here as the cause of happiness or blessedness. It's not primarily rooted in accomplishments such as making lots of money, marrying the right person, having the right job, winning a championship, many things that we equate to here in this life as producing happiness. Though I need to be quick and say, in my readings in Genesis, God blessed Abraham with a lot of wealth, and he said it was a blessing. So when we have those things, it is a blessing, and we're to acknowledge that before God. But there's a, a predominance here as to what is spoken of in Psalm 1, 
And it seems that Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, really is an amplification of Psalm 1. He gives nine characteristics as to who is the blessed person. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those persecuted for righteousness' sake. And he gives others. That sets the focus a little bit different as, as to who a biblically blessed person is that God esteems highly. Poor in spirit. That's someone who sees that they fall far short of God's glory. You know, we pastor led in a, in a prayer of confession. And, uh, and that's so important. And it's so important as I read my Bible and as I think about these things. Am I a doer of the word? Do I love delighting in God's word? And the answer is not as much as I would like to. So it becomes a prayer. Lord, help me. I'm still poor in spirit here and I'm needy. Which is one of the things that David cried out with in Psalm 86. He said, oh Lord, come to me. I am poor and needy. I think that's the reason God called him a man after God's own heart. That he saw that even though he was on the right path most of the time, he fell short. But it wasn't something that knocked him down. He found forgiveness immediately as he cried out. So am I growing in these things? The answer is not as much as I would like. But make that a matter of prayer. God, help me to mourn properly. God, help me to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Lord, give me a pure heart as you see it. And Lord, even help me to be blessed if I'm persecuted. I don't necessarily pray for persecution. <laughs> I'm just normal. But Lord, if it happens... You'll be a blessing to me. So, in summary here, we're prone to interpret blessedness in terms of what we see with our eyes and not what we see in God's Word. Living life horizontally involves a correct horizontal and biblical orientation. I should say living life successfully involves a correct horizontal and a vertical orientation. We are humans made in the image of God, and we were made to have fellowship with our Heavenly Father. But we are living on earth right now. And so I am to be a good supervisor, a good development person, a good husband. I'm to be a good man. You're to be a good woman or a good boy or a good girl as God determines those things. And I enjoy life as it comes to me. Living life solely or predominantly with a horizontal commitment is short-sighted. It's vanity. It's chasing after the wind. Living life growing in our rejoicing and trembling at who God has made us and the providential circumstances he's created for us, that's where successful living really is. And you know, this is the message of Ecclesiastes. My pastors just finished preaching through Ecclesiastes in January, which is a difficult book to understand and preach through. And I told a friend of mine, I said, I have been really blessed by this preaching series. It's lifted me up and it's given me joy. And one of my friends looked at me and said, really? So that's a dark book. Everything's vanity. Everything's chasing after the wind. Solomon tries this in labor and wisdom, and it's nothing. He tries this in pleasure and building. It's nothing. How can that lift you up? J.I. Packer was asked, what's your favorite book of the Bible? And he responded, Ecclesiastes, because it showed me how to live in a fallen world and have joy. He said he loved the theology of joy that permeated through the book of Ecclesiastes. That it encouraged him. It gave him joy in everyday activities even though they were limited in their success. It gave him joy 
and enjoying relationships, though they had difficulty. It gave him joy in his work, even though everything didn't turn out the way he would like. You see, Ecclesiastes lays the foundation for successful living. Throughout Solomon's pursuit of these things that all of us are involved in to some degree, there are things that are interjected that seem out of place. Notice this in chapter 2. There's nothing better for a person than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in his work. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. Really? Chapter 8, I commend joy to you. By chapter 8, Solomon's done a lot of deep diving into the world and what it offers, and he said it's empty, it's chasing the wind. Chapter 9, enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun. And I would add this, enjoy your favorite meal. Enjoy the fun times with your family and friends. That beautiful sunset, that dark, silky, chocolate bar that you might like. These are gifts from God. You see, God made us to find happiness in relationship with him. And the good gifts that we have now. Live life and enjoy life even if it's not as complete and fulfilling as you want, because God is involved, and he's given us things to enjoy right now. To live life as truly blessed people, we need to have a commitment and an understanding to Psalm 1. Blessed, the first two verses, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on this law day and night. Notice what it says here, that the blessed person delights in and meditates on God's word. James says the one who's a doer of the word is blessed. This psalm, the gateway to the psalms, setting the priority as to what is to be given to us throughout the Psalms, it mentions these specific things, delights in and meditates on God's Word. Now again, we have to reorient our mind to think biblical here. It says that this person delights in the law. You know, we tend to think of the law in a very narrow sense. The Hebrew word here is Torah, and it doesn't mean just the don'ts of life, not just the Ten Commandments, it's the whole of Scripture. So broadened our thinking that we are to delight and meditate on God's instruction to us. And the scripture says that this person who is blessed, he delights in it. And this is a present continuous action. Not just Sunday, but regularly. Oh, not every minute of every day. But there is an orientation on thinking of God's law that I Memorize, which is a wonderful thing, that I've heard in church, that I've read in my Bible. Lord, help me to internalize this. Help me to think on it. Help, me, help it to permeate my life. That's what meditation is. All of us deal with anxiety. I'm a senior citizen. My kids are grown. My health is still good. I'm in the golden years. But, you know, the golden years have their challenge. Uh, there's not a phase of life that doesn't have challenges. I don't care who you are, how much money you've got, how good your health is, your positions. Life is filled with all types of things because we live in a fallen world. But those who remember God's promises, who see God's promises as they, as they read, and say, Lord, I'm not practicing that anxiety-free living. Lord, help me. Because you're the one who controls my life. You're the one that will see me through. And as a matter of fact, Lord, James also says to consider it all joy when you encounter trials of various types. Really? Now that's difficult. And yet the blessed person 
who can grab hold of God's promises even when we can't see out of the clouds, what a blessing that is. The blessed person is satisfied in the Lord. Uh, he's not uh, basing his blessedness, his joy, uh, on something that can be taken away from him. But this joy is a deep-seated joy based on God's promises. Believers should not be gritting their teeth and grinding it out until we get to heaven and then the joy starts. No, the joy is to be right now. Jesus in John chapter 15, in speaking of the vine and the branches, he being the vine, we being the branches, he said that uh, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. And then he said in verse 11, I have told you these things that my joy may be in you and that your joy will be complete. Oh, what a blessing. Oh, Lord, help me to have that joy. I need to make that a matter of prayer personally. And I pray for others that that joy would be in them. The blessed person is also separated from the world. There's a positive statement here, but there's a negative statement. There's a warning that comes. The blessed one is someone who doesn't walk with the wicked. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners. He doesn't seat in the, sit in the company of mockers. You see, the blessed person is not being conformed to this world, though it's difficult not to be. He's progressively getting more and more involved in God's word, in God's ways. And he does that by letting the scripture guide him. Worldly culture is a powerful force. The unbelieving media of the world dominates the messages we see. Worldly culture caused us to think on race in unbiblical ways for centuries. Today, we're being groomed to think on marriage in unbiblical ways and legitimize LGBTQ things. But a blessed person delights and meditates on God's word. And he minimizes the effect of worldly culture. But notice also in this psalm, verses 3 and 4, there's a contrasting fruitfulness between the blessed person and the wicked. It says that the blessed person yields its fruit in season, and whatsoever he does prospers. Wow. Again, we have to reorient our thinking here. The blessed person, blessedness is not health, wealth, and things I own. It's being able to live life in a fallen world without the anxiety that drives us crazy, without thinking we've lost our purpose, with letting cynicism and despair get the best of us. Everybody has pain. The world has pain. But God said, listen, you saturate yourself in my word and you pray on it, and I'll lift you above that pain. I'll lift you out of that pain. And there's fruit that comes, the fruit of the Spirit. There's Christ-likeness. There's wonderful things that happen to us. Are you growing and delighting in God's word? Oh, Lord, help me. Make that a prayer that you have. And the growing believer is blessed. But notice the brevity of the words about the wicked. Not so the wicked. The believer prospers. Not so the wicked. The believer is fruitful. Not so the wicked. And then, as our time draws near uh, to uh, me closing this sermon, there's contrasting eternities. God says, that the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, but the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Brothers and sisters, for those who trust in Christ, the best is yet to come. And it doesn't depart. It's for eternity. Praise be to God who gives us this.